thank you for joining us for this Idaho Environmental Forum on Farming Carbon, Growing Hope, Climate Resiliency, and Federal Policy. I'm Brandi Wilson, an Idaho Environmental Forum board member. Idaho Environmental Forum is a nonprofit, nonpartisan educational association whose sole mission is to promote serious, cordial, and productive discourse on a broad range of environmental policies affecting Idaho. First, I'd like to thank our sponsors for making these events possible. You can find them on our website at Idaho Environmental Forum, all one word, dot org. While there, please sign up as a member so that you can keep joining us for these events. Uh, today, I'm joined by two really outstanding guests. We have with us uh, Jenny Connor Nelms, who leads agriculture policy for the Nature Conservancy. And she's the um, North America Policy and Government Relations um, Lead for, in Arlington, Virginia. She leads the Nature Conservancy's efforts on farm bill advocacy and coordinates with all 50 states in the, and the United States Department of Agriculture to implement federal ag agriculture conservation programs. We also have with us Andrew Walmsey, who joined the American Farm Bureau Federation in 2011 as the Director of Congressional Relations. In addition to leading the farm policy team, Andrew is charged with managing energy, climate, transportation, and biotechnology issues for, for the Farm Bureau. Um, he's held multiple leadership roles around Washington, D.C., and currently chairs the Farmers for a Sustainable Future Coalition. So, to begin today, I just want to do a little bit of scene setting. So let's travel back in time to February of 2020. So little did we know at that point that IEF had just had its last in-person lunch forum. Little did I know that the next time we would have a lunch forum would be today and it was going to be in my guest room. So everybody welcome to my guest room. And nobody knew who the president was going to be. There was still a huge field of Democratic presidential candidates. We didn't know how all of that was going to play out. And back then, back in February 2020, is when this coalition formed between um, agricultural industry folks and environmental groups who decided to take the reins together on what would make sense for federal climate policy. And so over many, many months and a bajillion Zoom calls, they actually worked together to craft the Food and Agriculture Climate Alliance and create a uh, document with over 40 policy recommendations in it. So these recommendations were released in November 2020, shortly after the election. And um, now as we have a federal administration who's in place that's focused on this topic, I'm really delighted to have Jenny and Andrew here to tell us the story and to answer your questions. So that brings us to a little bit of administrivia. So when you have questions, please type them in the chat box to me, Brandy Wilson. So we don't wanna have a whole big chat thing going on and side conversations and stuff like that. So please just send your questions straight to me in the chat function. And then please keep your video off and yourself on mute throughout. And um, with that, we will get started. So I'm going to turn it over first to Andrew to um, share with us a little bit about the Food and Agriculture Climate Alliance. So Andrew, floor is yours. Thanks, Brandy. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, last February, probably the last time a lot of us wore, last wore pants, right? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, appreciate the opportunity. I am going to jump into some slides, so I apologize for those on the phone, um, but happy to share those after the call. Uh, as I pull these slides, we're actually going to go a little bit further back in time uh, just to discuss kind of how we did get to this point. How did Farm Bureau in particular uh, end up sitting around the table with a bunch of different environmental groups that maybe isn't so uncommon in a lot of areas, but a bunch of environmental groups talking about climate, which is a space that uh, we probably have not been as engaged with uh, that, that community and others uh, up until more recently. And I'll give you a little background on how we ended up there. So. Uh, obviously an important uh, issue for agriculture. You know, the last time that Washington really focused on climate policy and had a robust debate was 10 to 11 years ago when we saw cap and trade and Waxman Markey. Uh, this was something that Farm Bureau had concerns with. We ultimately did not support. Uh, and I would say at the time, you know, agriculture really wasn't brought in um, and to get their thoughts. And, and there wasn't a lot of conversations before that legislation really started moving. Uh, there were some concessions along the way, but not enough to get us in a good spot. You fast forward, there's been a, a lot that has happened in the, in the climate space generally. You know, the world has changed. Uh, you look at many of the uh, challenges that a lot of producers have faced, but more importantly, you see a lot of the commitments that private industry has made, uh, different food companies that have made commitments, and, and these are all going to be impacting, uh, you know, farmers and ranchers. So this is something that you know, we have an industry affairs team at Farm Bureau. We're starting to work through that. And then you back to the policy piece. You know, last Congress, uh, the Green New Deal was introduced, uh, which obviously caused some consternation and a lot of conversation 
across the countryside and, and obviously across Capitol Hill, but it was an opportunity for us to get together with a lot of other uh, producer, farmer, grower, representing uh, organizations across town. Some of these you'll, you'll hopefully recognize. Um, pretty much those producer groups that represent farmers, we, we said, hey, let's get together, uh, let's have a discussion and see where we're at on this issue. Uh, and let's work with our champions on Capitol Hill. Let's figure out what message we need to be telling to, to congressional leadership. And let's see what data is out there. So one of the first things we did, we tasked our uh, econ team at Farm Bureau and some others to start pulling publicly available data. What narrative or, or what, is, what, what is the story of American agriculture right now when it came to climate and environmental sustainability? And so I wanna run through a few of those slides just to kind of set the stage and something that we share when we talk with our members. Um, you know, we're a grassroots organization. Uh, every county, uh, every farmer is represented by a county farm bureau. Those county farm bureaus come to create the states, states to create the American Farm Bureau plus Puerto Rico. We are grassroots driven. I, as a staff member, I'm, I'm not a, uh, some think tank ivory tower in Washington that comes up with great ideas. I have a policy book uh, and a membership that holds me accountable and, and I have to follow that. Um, but even that being the case is these policy discussions are staring us in the face as this train's coming down the track uh, to try to not end up being a grease spot on the LNN to quote the great movie, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? How do we catch that train or how do we end up actually driving that train? Uh, and part of that is just getting comfortable with talking about the issue. So one of the things you heard a lot around Green New Deal was that agriculture contributed 25% of greenhouse gas emissions. Well, that's true globally, but when you look at the U.S., we're actually closer to 10 percent. And I would say this slide here tells a lot of the story why uh, we are so much lower. Uh, because of the great work <clears throat> of our land-grant universities, of the public research investments, private research investments, and then that extension of getting that science and technology into our farmers' hands, uh, we really see what I think is an incredible story. In roughly two generations, American agriculture has increased our output by over 287% while our inputs have remained relatively flat. Uh, so what we're doing is producing more while basically using less. Uh, this is innovations in, in, in breeding technology, how we make improvement in our seeds and improve genetics in our herds. It's things like biotechnology, it's precision ag, it's all these things coming together uh, we're, we're really seeing what we think the future, and this is a platform we can continue to build upon around sustainable in intensification, uh, continuing to produce, to produce more, but also then being able to protect the natural resources that we need to. And so uh, we, we think this is, this is important. I'll just throw another number out here. I don't have a slide, but a recent number we did. You know, you look at the last 30 years, we've lost about 30 million acres of cropland across this country. Uh, a lot of that to development. Uh, the remaining cropland, though, when you look at our carbon emissions flux, uh, how much carbon, uh, how much we're emitting and the like, that has made, remained relatively steady while our per acres we're producing 50% more per acre, which is just an incredible story. Once again, just another way to kind of look at this. Uh, just to make sure we're clear what we're talking about here when we're talking about greenhouse gases, uh, here you can see by economic sector in the U.S. The one I would like to call attention to is the red line. That's our agricultural emissions. And then the light green line across the bottom, which is our carbon sinks. These are our forests, our grasslands, where we're actually sequestering carbon. And so as we start having these policy debates, whether it's through some of these private markets that are being developed or in Washington uh, on the role of government and societal benefits, it's how do we reduce this red line while increasing this light green line? Uh, and from a Farm Bureau perspective, what we're committed to do is to do that in a way uh, that we say sustainable, which in our minds means making sure our producers remain economically viable, that, that profitability is built in there because driving someone out of business is, is not a, a goal here. We have a moral imperative to feed nine and a half billion people in the next couple of decades. So how do we continue to, to grow and become better stewards? Good news is we've got some positive trends in that direction. When you look at livestock, this is one that you hear a lot of times that if we just stop eating meat, it would solve all the world's problems. Uh, Al Gore would stop shedding polar bear tears and everything would be right in the world. Uh, well, you know, I would just point that we recognize there are emissions in this sector. Uh, it's less than 4% or so. Some of these numbers are gonna be updated here. Uh, you can see where beef, cattle, dairy, and swine break out. I would argue it's somewhat relatively small. So as your lunch hour is progressing, 
Uh, hopefully I can entice you to pick up a hamburger, throw some cheese on there and a little bit of bacon and you're not feeling too guilty. And even if you kind of have a question, let's look at this next slide to see some of the trends we're seeing in our livestock industry. This is once again, one of those 30 year snapshots. This is our emissions per unit of production. So just once again, how we're producing more, but yet our emissions are coming down when you look at that per unit of, of production. Uh, for dairy, uh, we're down 25% in the last 30 years. Uh, swine, we're down 20% and beef cattle, we're down 10%. So positive trends. Uh, all of this done in a voluntary incentive-based manner. Uh, this is the market driving this. This is in investments in research or investments on our farms. Now, I don't want to hope I don't come across as arrogant and saying we don't need to do anything else and we've got it all figured out in American agriculture, but at least recognizing some of the work that has taken place and that we're looking for partners to find solutions into the future that we know we can't do it all alone. Uh, we know that some of the things that does work for agriculture and things that don't. And that's why, you know, we're wanting to be part of this conversation. Another way to look at it on our cropland is 30 year snapshot again to produce to what we produced in 2018 on the 1990 acreage, we would have needed 40 million more acres between then and 1990 of corn, 42 million more acres of soybeans, uh, 8 million more acres of, of wheat. For Farm Bureau though, it's not just what we're doing uh, on the production side, it's the other things that we support. And so our last snapshot at the census of ag, and um, it's a little dated, we're gonna have a new one here, and I think this number is even higher, but if you look at that five-year period, you saw a 132% increase in adoption of unfarm renewable energy generation. Uh, and you continue to see farmers adopt these technologies, especially as the costs come down, things like solar, wind, where we have wind resources, excuse me, and then methane digesters in our livestock industry where they make economic sense or we have the technical expertise to manage those. It's not just on the farm, it's the other policies we support. Uh, obviously biofuels uh, generally play a huge role for American agriculture. Uh, it's a demand driver for corn. Uh, it's, it's been a vital revitalization for many of our economic, or many of our rural communities. Uh, and it's providing real environmental benefits today. If you look at 2018, just a snapshot in that year, the use of ethanol and biodiesel reduced greenhouse gas emissions by 71 million metric tons. It's equivalent to taking 17 million cars off the road. This is a debate that we're gonna watch uh, closely as we go forward, as there's gonna be a large push towards electrification. Uh, you know, for us, we don't necessarily have an issue with, with uh, EVs, uh, but we still see the value in the internal combustion engine for the foreseeable future and the demand there. Uh, but we think biofuels can play a key role, uh, not only just reducing emissions near term, but also hopefully long term as uh, we can see maybe new de engine designs, higher compressions, higher efficiencies, and those types of things. But uh, we're, we're hopeful that renewable energy continues to play a key role because uh, of the benefits it provides to rural America. You know, you talk about a Green New Deal, uh, and I think we would argue in agriculture we've got that, and that's the Farm Bill. Uh, when you look at the conservation title of the Farm Bill, Title II, uh, if you look just at federal programs across this country, we have over 140 million acres enrolled. That land area is the equivalent to the sizes of the states of uh, California and New York. Uh, obviously, a huge investment taking place there. We think a lot of great work. That's something that we're hoping to build upon is through that conservation title in the Farm Bill. This doesn't count state, private, all the work that uh, TNC is doing in a lot of great areas isn't necessarily captured there, um, but something that we, we obviously want to recognize. But the key piece of this, as we have this climate debate, is that it takes place in the House and Senate Ag Committees. We think that's vitally important. Those are committees that all of our groups on here are comfortable working with. Uh, those are members of Congress that typically understand agriculture. Uh, and I have to say in the good news that the first two real hearings of this Congress, first in the House Ag Committee was on climate. Uh, that was back in February. My boss, President Zippy Duval, uh, was, was a witness there. Uh, and then the Senate Ag Committee, their first hearing in early March was also on climate. Uh, and we had uh, all the witnesses there were members of FACA, the Food and Agriculture Climate Alliance, which we'll talk a little bit more about. When we talk about practices, uh, just to give you once again a snapshot, you know, when you talk about soil soil sequestration, um, you know, agriculture is uniquely positioned as an industry. We're one of the few uh, that can actually sequester carbon and reduce emissions. And so some of the practices, just to give you an idea without going super in depth, is how, how do we get to conservation tillage? How do we go to cover crops? In the livestock industry, how do we reduce emissions maybe through feed additives, improve genetics, methane digesters uh, for our specialty crops? Is there ways to, to uh, 
you know, utilize less diesel? Is there ways across the industry to utilize less nitrogen fertilizer? These are all the things we're kind of looking at and trying to figure out how do we incentivize in the appropriate way to continue uh, the path the way we've been on in agriculture. So with all that being said, I want to introduce the Food and Agriculture Climate Alliance that Brandy talked about uh, on the top of the show. You know, this was uh, a unique opportunity. Uh, we had done the work with Farmers for Sustainable Future. That is a producer-led organization. Uh, but there was obviously a recognition that, that we should be branching out and looking for other partners. And so uh, we were presented the opportunity um, to work with folks like the Environmental Defense Fund, uh, brought in, you know, National Farmers Union, National Council of Farmer Cooperatives as kind of the four original co-chairs to say, hey, can we try to have this discussion uh, and see where it goes? Um, as we said, yes, let's, let's see where we go. We said, we got to bring in other partners. And um, I, don't, I don't trust anyone more than the environmental community than my good friend, Jenny Connor. So we've got to have Nature Conservancy. Uh, we brought in our forest owners with NAFO, uh, Food Marketing Institute, which is the broader food value chain, making sure that FMI was involved. Our State Departments of Ag, you know, the perspective that our commissioners uh, of agriculture have across the country and kind of the, the unique role they play uh, joined as well. Uh, you talk about a silver lining, I guess, in 2020. Uh, as we were just kicking this off in February, no one knew what, what was ahead of us, but as we really started getting down to work, uh, quickly DC shut down. We were all sequestered in our homes. And so, you know, traditionally, uh, you know, lobbyists and the like in Washington, we run to, to meeting to meeting, hopping in cabs, running across the Capitol, three martini lunches. No, the last part's not usually true. Um, but it's hard to uh, sit down and really focus on an effort like this, but the, the pandemic provided that opportunity. So either through just that new ability to focus or just being beat down after 10 to 12 hours a week of Zoom hell, we were able to come up with quite a robust list of recommendations in this space, but they all kind of hit on three simple principles. They need to be voluntary and market and incentive based. We got to be grounded in science. And we need to be promoting resiliency, not only of our farms, uh, of the environment, but also of our rural communities. And our one overarching goal was to do no harm. Do no harm to the environment, do no harm to the profitability of farmers and ranchers, do no harm to our communities, and finally, do no harm to existing conservation programs, existing USDA programs, because they were developed with a certain need in mind. Uh, they, they ha we still have resource concerns that we need to manage as farmers, ranchers, land managers, um, but how do we build out that framework at USDA to get the tools we need into the into our farmers hands. I'm not going to go too in depth because I think Jenny's going to hit on some of these, but they were broken out uh, into some of these areas. Obviously, we really don't plan on boring you for your whole lunch hour going through 50 pages of recommendations, but I think you have this link. You can also find them at the agclimatealliance.com. Since we launched, uh, we are now up over 60 something groups. I don't really know what the final number is at this point. Obviously not the final number. We continue to grow. But here's a snapshot of some additional steering committee members that have joined. So we've got about a steering committee of 25. Uh, talk about herding cats, so far so good. But you've got folks like Land Grant University. We've got uh, other commodity groups, folks like Ducks Unlimited. Um, so just to produce marketing association, make sure we bring in our specialty crop folks. And we've got some other, other environmental groups that have joined at the general membership. We welcome folks to join us. It doesn't cost anything to join as a general member. Uh, we are not actually having businesses join at this point, but if you're part of an association, even at the state level, uh, feel free to, to join uh, and you'll be able to join our monthly calls. And as we get into the advocacy stage, uh, we'll be able, uh, you'll be able to engage from that standpoint. I'm going to hold off on this slide and that might be something more for discussion um, as to where we see things going. So I'm going to turn it over now to, to Jenny to kind of run through I think a little bit more of uh, some of our recommendations and, and where things could be going on Capitol Hill. So with that, Jenny, I turn it to you. Great, thank you, Andrew. And, and Andrew's running my slides for me too. See, we're definitely a team. Um, so I, I have to go back. I think that I was, I have worn pants in the past year, uh, but it is definitely the last time I wore a suit was February of last year. So. There's certain things I miss and there's certain things I don't miss. And I think that's one of them. Um, so I'm gonna go through a little bit and just talk about why we have hope here, why this is different, uh, building on everything that Andrew has, has given as far as a background and as far as um, kind of the, the place that we find ourselves right now. And um, before I do that, I just wanna share a, a short story um, 
so I started off with the Nature Conservancy in the Florida chapter in this terrible assignment in the Florida Keys with a gorgeous office on the water. And uh, I had a trustee ask me maybe a year or so after I'd started, why isn't an environmental organization working on the farm bill? And, um, and I was really taken aback by that. And I, my answer, I should have thought about it a little bit more, but I, I think it was good. You know, how can we not? How can we not work on ag policy when 70% of the land in the lower 48 is privately owned, managed? You know, that it's a huge opportunity to work with these partners and these landowners. And so I'm really glad, you know, fast forward now 20 years. This is my 20th year with TNC. I um, started when I was 10. And I think that it's really grown a lot. It's really, um, I'm excited by the opportunity. I'm, you know, we're not the only ones now saying, look at these great partners. And um, I'm not saying we were before, but in some places we did find ourselves on, on, on that side of things. So I, I'm very excited to be where we are. I, I just wanna underscore that this is different. And that's one of the reasons that we have hope. Um, as Andrew said, Waxman Markey um, from, I guess, 10 years ago, you know, ag was not brought to the table, I think, in the same way as, um, or in the way that it should have been, maybe. And I don't think you're going to expect anyone to, you know, sign on to something that they were not a part of building, unless, you know, they, they don't have a huge stake in it. And agriculture certainly does have a huge stake in this. So I think that's one thing that we're doing this time around that is very different, and it's critically important. Um, in the groups around this this table that we have um, at at our at our alliance, our FACA alliance, you know, it represents all across the the supply chain and also um, Environmental Defense Fund and the Nature Conservancy were there, you know, through the first part developing the recommendations, and now, as Andrew mentioned, it's just grown. It's grown so much uh, with some just really great groups that we're looking forward to working even more with. The second part I would say is, you know, this is bipartisan. When you work with the committees on the Hill, it's really easy to, to see the partisanship. It's easy to see how, you know, something may not get through one committee or the other, you know, interior may not, it, it may go down party lines every single vote. And I think I've been lucky, uh, we've all been lucky that work on this space because agriculture is bipartisan. We all need healthy food systems and we, we need them for a variety of reasons, whether it's the bumper sticker with no farms, no beer, uh, or if it's, you know, clean water and you want to you be able to swim in it in the Gulf of Mexico and have a vacation, you know, it, it goes all across. We all need to be able to do this together and, and end up with a healthy, sustainable food system. So I think that's the second big key. And then the third one is something that Andrew had gotten to already, which is, you know, what's different about this, where we find ourselves now is that it's listening. We, we need to listen to each other in a way that we may be not you know, have done that before. And so being open to that dialogue, sitting down and knowing that we're not going to agree on everything, there's, there's no way we would, or we'd be the same organization. Um, we all have our own place in, in the world and being able to find out where those places overlap um, and where we're willing to kind of, you know, scratch out some stuff that we can work on, that's, that's a really um, great place to be right now. So those are my three biggest kind of overarching uh, messages that I would have is that, you know, we do have opportunity for hope here because agriculture is bipartisan and we are listening to each other now. So uh, next slide, please, Andrew. Thank you. I'm gonna run through just a couple of these. I, I like Andrew said, we don't need to read to you, certainly. Um, there are 50, however many pages of recommendations that we've come out with. And, and we're actually putting a little bit more on those. We're, we're fleshing those out more now. So it's gonna be even longer the next time that we put something out there. Um, but in it, these, are, these are a couple of the ones that, um, that we're working on in a big way that have really built um, around partnership. And so the first one of those is the most important, I think, for us to remember is, you know, we're really aimed at providing voluntary and incentive-based tools for farmers for ranchers, forest owners, so that they can maximize the sequestration of carbon um, and reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. And also, as we pointed out earlier, it's increasing the resilience of the land because it doesn't do us any good, you know, if we're doing it on a short term. If we do it on a long term, that's what matters to, to farmers and to forest owners, to ranchers, because that's been their land and, 
in many cases, we're dealing with generational, you know, um, issues and a pride in place. And so we, we really need to um, remember that, I think. Um, the second one is very popular right now, um, which is supporting the development uh, and overseeing the private sector markets for uh, greenhouse gas credits. I will be the first to admit that um, I am not a greenhouse gas uh, or adaptation or um, additionality or any of those things expert. Uh, but what we've seen is that producers really are looking for some help in this area because they see opportunity. Um, they have some groups that are reaching out to them and you know, here's something you could do. And they don't know how to compare that maybe to some other um, other markets, private markets, and what does that mean for me on my land? So what we're really trying to do is figure out how to help them, um, how to help produce, producers um, come up with, you know, answers, whether that's through the federal government and private sector. Um, we're really trying to support both through these recommendations. Then the third one is um, increasing federal investment in research, ag research, forestry research, food related research. And the two words here are substantially and continuously. Um, if if you you know work in this space, you know that um, a little bit is good, but a lot really makes a difference. And having it one year, you know, maybe we can get something done, but it needs to be done every year. And we need to really recognize the value in agencies like uh, USDA Ag Research Service or others. We need to realize that there's a lot to bring to bear there to not only individual projects but to landscapes and. There are, um, as we enter this climate and ag space more and more, there are things we don't know. And there's research that could be done to help us uh, be more productive, more, more efficient in that. So that's a big, big part of it for us. And then the last one I would mention is, again, going back to one of the slides that Andrew has, is offering those incentives for farmers, not only to reduce their energy consumption, but um, to increase the use of on-farm renewable energy and then make progress towards reducing those emissions, uh, both in ag and in forestry on renewable energy. So we're seeing that, um, you, you tend to think of it happening maybe just in the Midwest or just in the, you know, the corn states. And we're actually seeing a lot of work that's happening now on that renewable energy piece um, through wind and through solar and through others. So there's a lot there I think that we um, are gonna be able to make um, make use of as far as the recommendations even this year we're moving forward with some pretty specific recommendations there so we're excited about that one too. Uh, next slide please. Thanks. So I just wanted to touch on this bipartisan piece again uh, quickly. I'm sure you all know who um, who these people are, some of you do anyway. This is our, our agriculture leadership in the house. Now this does not have the appropriators on it the folks who are handing out the money, but it does show we've got a new, um, in the House Agriculture Committee, we have a new chairman, uh, David Scott from Georgia, and we've got a new ranking member in uh, GT Thompson from Pennsylvania. And so some of what we're looking at is uh, the two of them starting to work together, their staffs starting to work together. And I think um, both on the House side and the Senate side, as, as Andrew mentioned, they're really looking to FACA uh, for recommendations and um, for answers to some of these questions that they have in, in how they work together in a bipartisan way to address climate and agriculture. So in the Senate Ag Committee, that's uh, Chairwoman Debbie Stabenow from Michigan and then the ranking member, John Bozeman from Arkansas. Um, and I'll say that John Bozeman is also new in his position. So out of these four leadership positions, only one has been in agri uh, leadership before. Next slide, Andrew. And then here's your uh, congressional delegation. And you'll notice that all of your names are in red. So that's because I did it based on uh, um, Republican and Democrats. So uh, in the Senate, we have 50-50 split. Um, and in the House, a very slim majority um, with Democrats. And then you've got your congressional delegation, which is all Republican. But here's why I have hope, too. Um, again, agriculture is a bipartisan issue. And that is across, I think, conservation, which we can see from some of your members, um, and also from agriculture. In fact, um, your, your senior senator uh, is, is having conversations with uh, Debbie Stabenow, Senator Stabenow, and um, Senator Braun about the Growing Climate Solutions Act. And um, 
you know, we were really excited to see him and, and his office take an interest in that. And, um, and so that also gives me hope that people like that are, are thinking about it and see the value for their producers in their states. Uh, next slide. There we go. As I say, I think I'm, I'm, that's my last one. Um, and we have a prize for anybody except for Andrew who can guess where this picture was taken. Um, <laughs> this is my contact information and um, I hope you will use it. And um, with that, I will yield back to Brandy. All right, well, thank you guys so much for giving us a, that grounding and overview of what you've been working on. I can't even imagine doing all of those negotiations over Zoom meetings over so many months. That's <laughs> that in and of itself that you were able to accomplish it is a sign of hope to me, um, having spent some time in those types of Zoom meetings myself over the last year. So um, we have had a couple of questions come in. So um, the first question, is uh, for Andrew. And uh, first off, thank you for sharing information about adoption of renewable energy by farmers and producers. What do you think are the barriers to adoption in some areas where the adoption rate of those technologies is low? Yeah, so renewable energy is is a, a extremely fascinating subject uh, for me. This is when I started early on in my career back when I was at Florida Farm Bureau. So I've been working on this issue almost 15 years. And so a lot of it depends on, on resources. You know, when you're talking about the environment, you know, wind works in certain areas and make economic sense. Obviously that becomes more competitive as those costs come down. But a lot of rural and re renewable energy adoption depends on local and state policies. Uh, you've seen uh, some widespread deployment in California because of their climate laws, AB 32. Uh, they're actually making investments in methane digesters. Uh, obviously, there's there's other strings that come attached to that, so that's maybe not a policy for the rest of this country. You've got the Northeast with the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, uh, where you see some some basically cap and trade taking place, uh, and and you're starting to see though that market expand with their renewable natural gas credits to where we're actually starting to see investment in uh, digesters once again with the hog farms in North Carolina, dairies in the Southeast that are tapping in and creating renewable natural gas and then getting a credit from that market. So you're seeing that investment. So it's a, it's a combination of factors. There's issues around net metering, interconnectivity, uh, you know, how you're, you work with your local rural co-ops uh, down to, you know, some of these other markets that might be prodding it along. And then technology. I mean, some of the issues, uh, you know, I continue to use Digester as an example. I just find it to be fascinating. It's a, it's a platform for other environmental benefits. Um, you know, we looked at trying to do it in dairies in Florida uh, and, and actually did a value added producer grant with USDA to really study the issue. Uh, and what we found out is that, yeah, you know, it works in the Midwest in a lot of ways, but for Florida, our biggest limiting factor was sand. We don't, we utilize sand as bedding for our dairy cattle because that was basically our soil type. The, the state soil of Florida is Mayaka fine sand. Uh, so it was everywhere. Uh, so it wasn't really a cost for producers, but it did a really good job at cooling those dairy cattle during the summer months. Uh, and that wasn't a trade-off that a lot of producers wanted to make um, because you didn't have, you know, some of the other bedding materials out there, heat and humidity didn't, you know, bode well, whereas sand, you didn't have those problems. And so if you interject sand into a mechanical system, typically it doesn't last too long. So it's, it's really variable and I got really in the weeds there and I'm sorry, but I get excited when we start talking about renewable energy. So I'll stop, Brandy. No, this is a very nerdy group. So I think that's probably there was a lot of people out there nodding saying, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So thank you for that. And actually, the next question is kind of nerdy, too. So we'll just keep you going here. Um, uh, when you were sharing about the soil carbon and, and some of the um, some of the issues around that. Uh, one of our one of our listeners is interested in hearing um, any of your thoughts on soil moisture and kind of the role that that plays and um, whether NOAA's National Coordinated Soil Moisture Monitoring Network program has a role to play in all of this or even if you're familiar with that. So that question's for Jenny, right? Yeah, and if it, and if this question if that's like no, the sir. wrong direction of nerdy, then we can we have I've got some other questions here, but <laughs> yeah, no, I don't know if I I can give you a, a very detailed or educated response in that. I mean, I think it does highlight though, you know, the diversity of agriculture across this country, uh, all the regional challenges, the different soil types. Uh, obviously, soil moisture plays a huge role. 
uh, it, it, for agriculture. I mean, there's some parts of the, the country, your, your greatest crop insurance tool in the sense is investing in irrigation, right? Um, mm -hmm. Other areas, you know, we hear constantly from our members is like, I would love to do a cover crop, but I'm limited because I'm competing with my moisture from, you know, my main crop. And so right. how do you manage that? So that's why one of the key themes that you'll find through the faculty recommendations from our groups is we need more agricultural research. We need to bolster USDA resources. We need our land grants, the idea of utilizing climate hubs to look at that regional diversity and those challenges. But that the fact that this has to continue to be voluntary and incentive based because uh, some of the, the, the carbon markets are going to favor probably certain regions of the country uh, that, that producers are really going to be able to take advantage and it's going to present challenges to other parts of the country. And so that's where I think the question comes in is what role does the public, uh, you know, provide that public good, uh, those societal benefits that agriculture can, can present. Um, what investments do we need there? What are those barriers and how can we incentivize additional practices? It's really uh, why it needs to be voluntary going forward. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, in particular to Idaho, we're already seeing a lot of that and hearing some of those conversations about, yeah, there's these great carbon markets. They're really looking to cover crops. I can't grow a cover crop unless I somehow get water out here in the winter. So, you know, some of those conversations about how those things work are already taking place. So I think it is really interesting. And I, I do agree with you. It's got to be voluntary and incentive based, which brings us to another topic that actually this one was a question for Jenny about incentives. So um, the, the person has heard a lot from farmers, ranchers and stakeholders that have difficulty in participating in the incentive based tools that we already have because of red tape or knowledge or resources. Um, is there anything in particular that the Nature Conservancy is doing to help um, help folks navigate that? I love that question. Um, so, uh, yes, so that's you're not the first person to ask that question either and to, to bring up that issue, of course. Uh, one thing that we're doing uh, both within the FACA recommendations and uh, just the Nature Conservancy is, you know, we're really trying to remove those barriers to adoption, um, whether it's, you know, livestock, um, the, the livestock and grazing space or whether it's the soil health space. Um, we know that uh, technical assistance uh, for farmers is a really big deal um, and part of the one of the biggest, I would say, barriers to adoption is, quite frankly, um, NRCS, FSA, but NRCS probably more, you know, does not have the technical assistance capacity to, um, to get out there and to do everything that they could do, should do, um, want to do, um, if they had more capacity. They're amazing partners, uh, but they're down, I think, uh, the last thing I heard was it was almost 2000 positions from like six years ago. And so um, I know that one of the things that they're looking at is, is trying to figure out how to, you know, staff up a little bit and get out there. Um, so being able to, we definitely support improvement on that by streamlining a, a forward looking conservation practice approval process. That's another thing. Um, and we'd also like to really recruit and train um, additional NRCS technical professionals um, and technical service providers, those TSPs that are in states, because they need to be able to direct, um, you know, the technical assistant, uh, assistance to producers, whether that's, um, like Andrew had mentioned, installing the, the digesters or um, if it's, you know, getting out there and helping to write a soil health management plan. Um, that's, that's really what they need to do. So we're hoping to see a lot of that. There's an awful lot of uh, streamline and help producers with the um, removing barriers in technical assistance within our report. Great. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, and so speaking of some of those um, conservation practices, uh, how much money can producers save by implementing some of these soil conservation practices? Um, the, the person who's asking the question has heard anecdotally up to like $100 an acre in savings. Is that something that either or of your organizations or, or FACA in general has been looking into? Well, I will answer that. Um, yes, I know there's people at TNC who know that answer um, on our agriculture science side. I am not the person, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, there's probably people even within Idaho on our ag team who know that. Um, Andrew, how about you? Well, I'm going to pretend I'm an economist and say on one hand, uh, yeah, you can probably find a lot of scenarios where you see those savings uh, and, and we're seeing farmers adopt that because of that. 
Um, but on the other hand, it really depends on the certain financial situation of some farms. And once again, it depends on, uh, how, you know, is, is it rental land or do you own it? Um, you know, where are you in the country? Can you easily do a cover crop? What's your labor situation? You know, we go back to the cover crop question earlier. Uh, maybe it's not a moisture issue or a technical issue. It's a human capital issue. If I'm, you know, uh, just a farmer or, or you know, and, and I'm in the middle of, of harvest, my livelihood, do I get off that tractor to go plant a cover crop? You know, how, how does that work? It's those kind of questions we're trying, you know, to work, work through. And so I think it depends on the practice. Um, you know, there's some times where I think some folks might be see a yield drag in some situations. Uh, we're trying to look at ideas there to help overcome that. So longer term, you know, you're ensuring profitability. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's just got to continue to be those options on the table and making farmers, you know, empowered to make the right decisions and then giving them resources uh, to do that. So speaking of having those options on the table, um, is there anything that we can do at a state level or state level policies that might support um, the federal level policies that, that you're looking at or that could help th um, improve the mechanisms for the soil based carbon markets at a state level? So I will just jump in on one piece of this and then and then Andrew can have a better answer probably. But I would say that on one side of this, it is extremely helpful for states to, that have, uh, for instance, the some kind of matching fund or some other innovative way <laughs> um, to be able to access federal funding that is available. And so for instance, uh, one that I'm thinking of is in Florida, because that's you know where I came from. It's where Andrew came from, and we didn't know each other at the time, which is pretty funny. Um, so in Florida, we actually developed what's called the Rural and Family Lands uh, Program, and it was you know supported. Major Conservancy worked very closely with the Florida Cattlemen's Association at the time um, to put this together. It was one of those things where we could that was mostly on easements. Um, but we were able to then have this state pot of funding that would be able to match federal farm bill funding and um, and it made it so that that was something available for the producers. Um, similar to that are some of the soil health plans that the states have in place now. Um, healthy soils legislation has been on the, um, you know, either I would say last year, last two years and some this year, um, I think in 42 states is the last number I heard. And many of those are, you know, just trying to find the funding. I think it hit a little bit of a hiccup with COVID and with all of the money that the states have, have lost. And some of them are in such a tough place, they're not able to fund um, these programs. But I know that there were some of the programs in, um, I want to say it was Representative Pingree's bill that was introduced last year, you know, it was set up a new grant program that would make more funding available for states to be able to access to write the management plans and to implement those practices. So um, we may see that in another piece of legislation coming up um, or some, uh, some version of that. And I think it would be really helpful because it's difficult for a state to take that on on their own. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, Andrew, what would you add? Yeah, I mean, money always makes things, you know, go right it greases the wheels but uh, that can be a challenge but i think jenny's on spot you know how do you complement some of the federal programs how do we look at technical assistance i mean additional ag research that's specific uh, to idaho how do we make sure our extensions appropriately funded and we're, we're positioned for the 21st century uh, are there other voices that that farmers trust in this space that we can get involved from sort of by crop advisors to our vets to uh, others maybe in private industry or, or State Department of Ag that works closer with producers than maybe USDA in some instances, making sure they're at the table. And then the one that uh, I think is important that, that doesn't cost anything uh, is, is redress grievances uh, with your elected federal officials that, that's protected in the First Amendment. Make sure you're communicating with your congressional delegation to know, for, let them know what's important to the state and how you envision any federal programs uh, working that make sure farmers' interests are, are presented and that, that this is an issue for, for Idaho and that they should be engaged in the discussion that's happening in Washington, D.C. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a strong proponent of, of um, you know, think local, act local, uh, all politics are local and the importance of our states. Um, but we also don't want to create a framework here uh, with private markets or anything that 
uh, puts a state at a disadvantage or make it harder to sell credits across state lines. So it's really thinking about those complementary actions that a state can do to help support these programs and then making sure, you know, your federal delegation is engaged. Yep, that's always good advice. Uh, stay involved, stay engaged. So um, has the Food and Agriculture Climate Alliance, your group, have you guys set a goal for carbon sequestration on farmland or in forests? And do you think that such a goal would help to make a dent in reducing carbon uh, globally? Is that something that you guys have, have looked at or just really looking at more of the frameworks around carbon sequestration? So, uh, uh, go ahead, Andrew. We purposely didn't set a goal or a framework. Okay. When you look at the diversity of, of the membership and how we wanted to expand that out and have several voices at the table, uh, we knew that would make it difficult. I don't have policy saying we should support this or that. Um, so that's part of the reason. Plus, we didn't really want to box Congress in. We wanted to put ideas on the table and say, hey, we're partners here. Uh, what, what can we agree to? And that's why you see such broad recommendations. You know, we're not saying you know, this one issue is going to solve all our problems because there is no silver bullet in this space. And so providing options and being engaged. And I hate the cliche, you know, right? If you've ever been in Washington more than a minute, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And so what we're trying to do is set that table and have as many guests join as possible. Yeah, that's great. I would just add to that, Brandy, that one of the things, um, you know, that you'll see throughout these recommendations in that regard is flexibility. And, and that goes, you know, exactly to what Andrew just said about, you know, one size does not fit all, whether it's with the practice, whether it's with the, um, funding model with the, you know, we're looking at performance-based tax credits. We're looking at, you know, the carbon bank is, is a very, very sexy topic right now. Um, and Mr. Walmsley here was just on the, interviewed for that apparently today. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at everything and we know that flexibility on the farm, on a ranch, in a forest, you know, is just as important as it on policy. So you'll see that throughout these 52 pages of recommendations. Yeah, and um, one of the recommendations has to do with on-farm renewable energy, which we geeked out on a little bit earlier. But um, as an alternative, um, has the group discussed um, promoting electrification and farming, like battery-powered tractors and things like that? Is that something that was that's been discussed? Hey, we're all about innovation and new ideas. Uh, I've just not been educated that the technology exists yet. I mean, I think we see electrification coming from, you know, uh, service fleets and short distance fleets and obviously, um, you know, passenger vehicles. If the technology gets there and it makes sense, I think we're open to adopting it. I just think there's a lot of challenges with the size of equipment we're running these days, the weight of those batteries, uh, the, the time we have to run them. I mean, when it's harvest, you're going full stop. And so unless we've got really long extension cords, um, I'm not sure how it's going to work, but we're open to it. Very good. All right. Well, as we're sort of uh, getting to the winding down phase of our lunchtime together, um, I just wanted to ask each of you one last question and I'll give you a second to think about it here. Um, out of all of the 50 page, 52 pages of this document, 40, over 40 recommendations, you know, Jenny, you hit on four in your um, presentation that are particularly near and dear to your heart. What recommendation do you think is really going to carry us further down the path for sustainable agriculture and addressing our, our carbon emissions and, and climate change? So what, what recommendation is just like your, your personal favorite? What do you think is really going to make the biggest difference? And um, if you could just kind of talk about those a little bit, that would be great. So we'll just use that to kind of skid into the last few minutes of our time together today. And um, then we'll wrap up with a, with a few other notes. So. Which, whichever one of you wants to go first. I don't know, do you do rock, paper, scissors or something? So Andrew, I'll go first because I think I've already hit on mine mostly. I, I think that, you know, a combination of flexibility and technical assistance is absolutely what we're gonna need no matter what, um, no matter which of these recommendations you're looking at, we need to know you know, what has the greatest potential for carbon sequestration, uh, for methane emission, for, you know, we need to support that research. All of those things have, to, they take people and they, and they take money. And so when I'm looking at something and actually getting conservation on the ground, working with the producers, I truly think that, you know, expanding that capacity and support for, for technical assistance um, 
and maybe that means flexibility for the technical service providers. Um, I'm a, I'm a big believer in that. And I think that that actually, I think that's cheating a little bit on my answer because it covers everything. Um, it, it may not cover maybe like the carbon bank, but I think it covers everything else. And that's why I think it's critical. It lifts all ships. Fantastic. Uh, Andrew, what do you think? I'll start with a DC answer and then see if you try to hold me to giving you just one. I mean, <laughs> you're a your favorite child, right? You just can't do it. I know, I know, uh, I know. You know. When you look over all of the factor recommendations, I really look at it through two lenses. Uh, there's a set of recommendations that, that really focus on trying to encourage private markets. How do we uh, reduce any barriers of entry for producers that want to participate in those markets? Uh, how do we maybe get some of those verification costs down to make sure more money's going to farmers' pockets? You know, that's really a track that I think benefits our larger landowners in forestry and agriculture, those really innovative entrepreneurial folks that want to go just sequester that carbon, destroy that carbon dioxide, let them loose and let them invent. Yeah. And then we can't forget our smaller farmers. We can't forget those that um, just are saying, I'm trying to make ends meet. I want to continue to be a good steward. How do I incrementally uh, improve my footprint of my farm? And so we've got recommendations that look at that, that build on existing programs. So I think that's the overarching, uh, I think, beauty of some of our recommendations is that we are trying to count for, for all regions of all farmers and providing that flexibility that Jimmy talked about. Um, but I won't do that to you, Brandy. I'll, I'll put you, I'll give you my <laughs> one, uh, is that we've got some reg, uh, recommendations around uh, improving the regulatory environment for innovation. I mean, I don't think there's one thing that frustrates farmers more uh, than, than, than red tape or, or DC holding back innovation. And so we, we've got a set that looks at how do we uh, maybe improve uh, the government oversight of genetically uh, engineered uh, gene edited animals, uh, moving that to USDA from FDA, because right now FDA treats them as a an new animal drug, uh, which just is, is not going to work for innovation. And so uh, USDA having oversight there and, and looking at improvements at FDA's approval of feed additives. Uh, there's so much science and so much space there that, you know, we, we spend so much time focusing on the back end of animals. You know, we want to talk about the animals themselves and what goes in them. There's more opportunities right. there for improvement. So that little section about some uh, in a, uh, regulatory relief, I guess, that, that would foster innovation is my favorite piece. Very good. Well, thank you for picking one. I know that was tough because you've been working on all of these. And I just want to thank both of you for joining us today. Um, I think this has been a really great conversation. It's something that is near and dear to our hearts here in Idaho. So I really appreciate y'all taking the time out uh, to visit with us. And um, it's just so timely with some of the things that are going on right now. Um, we were talking a little bit before we, uh, before we opened up the forum today. The USDA is actually having a comment period right now on carbon and agriculture and what they should do in this space. And so I think it's great that um, you guys have all come together over the past year. And, and as you said, Andrew, really set the table for this conversation and um, come together with some solid proposals uh, for, for Congress to think about. So um, I'd like to thank you guys for joining us today. And I'd also like to uh, hand out a big thank you to everybody who has joined us from IEF today. Um, if you'd like to be added to our member list or you'd like to help us by becoming a sponsor, please visit Idaho Environmental Forum, all one word, dot org. And again, thank you to our current sponsors because we could not do any of this without you. So here's all of our sponsors so you can see everybody on there. And uh, we do really appreciate their, their help and, and especially sustaining us through this past year when we've been doing a lot of these virtually and, and putting our forum shorts out there. If you haven't checked out our forum shorts, please go out and check some of those. Um, we've got some really interesting things uh, going on out there as well. So thank you um, and uh, join us next time. And until then, everybody stay safe and safe and healthy. <laughs> Have a great day. Bye-bye.